How do we think about servanthood theologically? The short answer is we think about it in relationship to God as its beginning and as its end. Already in creation, God creates us in his image. He gives Adam and Eve to one another. He gives the whole of the creation to them. And they're supposed to exercise a kind of delegated lordship, a dominion over all things. And they do so by, well, serving, right? Other creatures, creatures are going to serve them, but they also have to take care of those creatures, take care of the environment and take care of one another. But fundamentally, they do all of this kind of mundane service in service to God. They have to obey him. They have to order their activities in relationship to his wisdom and his righteousness and his holiness. And so the goodness that God gives them will image God insofar as that goodness also overflows to others and intensifies as they draw near to God. So by virtue of what we are as creatures, we're supposed to image God. Obviously, sin complicates this and ruins it entirely. Um, instead of our service being directed towards God, being directed towards other things, we start redirecting that service towards ourselves. Ironically, we actually end up servants of sin, right? Uh, we end up serving mammon. Um, we end up serving the desires of our flesh. And so what ends up happening is instead of exercising dominion over the things, we, we have this kind of perverted dominion um, of other things over ourselves. What Paul says is the dominion of sin reigning in our mortal bodies. And so by virtue of sin, the original picture of our service to God and others is thwarted. And we end up forgetting God in our service of uh, others and ourselves. And what ends up happening is that we end up depriving not only ourselves of the goodness that's due to us, but also other things. That predicament, however, is not scripture's last word. Obviously, when we turn to the New Testament, um, we find that Jesus gives us the clearest picture of servanthood and how he rescues us from sin. Thankfully, the answer to this predicament is also the very heart of a theology of servanthood, and that is our Lord Jesus Christ. Genesis tells us that the first Adam was the source of the first Eve, right? Well, the New Testament kind of reverses this pattern, and the second Adam, Jesus, it comes from the second Eve. So when Gabriel announces to Mary, Virgin Mary, that she will conceive by the Holy Spirit and she will give birth to the Son of God, her first words are uh, reflective of servanthood. She says, I am the servant of the Lord. When Paul talks about the eternal Son of God becoming incarnate for us and for our salvation, he says that he humbled himself by taking on the form of a servant. So if we're listening very carefully, Paul describes our Lord's entire humanity, his whole human nature, the, everything he ever did in our flesh with one word, service. So if Jesus is the center and the meaning of what service is, then he gives us a very pointed example of this with his cross. That's exactly what Paul goes on to talk about in Philippians 2, where he says that Jesus became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus gives us a vivid portrait of this in John 13 when he washes his disciples' feet. He gets up from the, the table, he puts on a servant's towel, he washes their feet, and he tells them this, this is a very, this is obviously a picture of him washing them by his blood and by his spirit. And he says, importantly, this is an example he has given to them, and they should go also and do likewise. If a servant is not greater than his master, then we are not greater than our master who is himself a servant. And so we are f set free, imitating Christ, to be servants of all, freely and joyfully. So as we go on to think about what service is and we go on to serve others, we have to take our cues from Jesus. Now, Jesus knows that we are prone to take our cues from elsewhere. He warns us about this in Mark 10. He says, if you look at the Gentiles, the way they use power, is they do it to, they lord it over others, they oppress others, and they exalt themselves. And he says, it is not so among you. He's talking to his followers. And again, we have to pay careful attention. He doesn't say, it should not be the case that among you, you, as it were, sometimes use power like the Gentiles do. He says, it is not the case among you. If servanthood is characterized by the way that Christ characterizes it, then it has to run through the one place where God's power where God's glory is most visibly manifest, and that is the cross of Christ. Now, this is a powerful word. It's not just a warning to the church about being careful that its own accounts of service and power don't look too much like the world. It's also a powerful summons to pick up our cross and follow him daily. What are some takeaways for a theology of servanthood? Well, I think the way that New Testament frames it 
is that servanthood is deeply bound up with humility. That's how Paul ties these two realities together in Philippians 2. That's how they're tied together in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. In Revelation 19, right before the marriage supper of the Lamb, a voice comes out from the throne of God and says, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, small and great. Uh, this picture of the heavenly liturgy, of, of the, the joy and the praise that we are beckoned to draw near to in the end, this is a picture of servanthood, right? And a servanthood in which we are glorified in the Lord's presence. Um, but there's also a sense of our humility. A servanthood that looks like Christ's servanthood, it's bound up with humility. It's bound up with counting others more significant than ourselves. It's one that exalts others, it doesn't put them down. It's one that makes others big, it doesn't make them small. And fundamentally, it's one that doesn't really look to serve ourselves, it's one that looks to serve others. And in so doing, serving the God who made us and who will glorify us in his own time.